Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of the Age of Sigma narrative show. Um, this will hopefully be a regular show, probably fortnightly, weekly, if it ends up getting to that sort of demand. And we will be bringing you lots of Age of Sigma content and just general knowledge regarding Age of Sigma and its narrative implications and narrative play. Um, so, to start off, my name's Luke. Um, I'm a Age of Sigma player through all three years. I've played fantasy since the early editions of fantasy. I've seen percentages come and go in that game. And narrative has always been something that's inspired me to keep going in the game. And tonight I'm joined by who will be my regular co-host, Mr. Andrew Bigwood. Take it away. Uh, g'day all. Um, I'm well, Warhammer up from way back. First started fantasy in third edition. Um, 40k in uh, Rogue Trader. Um, always been about the story for me. Um, telling a story with models on the tabletop. Anything you can do as far as I'm concerned. That and making sure your army looks beautiful on the table. Yeah, that's always an important thing. Like anyone can start to paint on, but having a beautiful army, beautiful story is what we're all about here. Definitely. So, um, to sort of talk about what we want to achieve with this particular show, um, we want to encourage people to not necessarily go full on narrative. Like, we're not trying to get people to go to narrative events or play narrative campaigns. Like, that'd be really cool, but it's not the aim. It's to try and get that little bit of narrative into your games. Because it's a part of the hobby that we both enjoy and we think everyone can get a little bit of enjoyment in some way from um whether or not it's just naming your characters to picking something where they live and talking about what they do or you know the rivalries between you and your friends um narrative just gives us something extra to the game and it can give extra like even a tournament game can get that little bit more from having that little bit of narrative in it. Indeed. Um, so I think that's the primary goal, really. It's just to sort of try and get that little bit of narrative into everyone's games and just talk a little bit about the narrative. It doesn't often get explained by a lot of people. There are some really great YouTube channels that do some great narrative stuff, um, like Doug in 2 Plus Tough is really great at doing a lot of narrative um but what i want this show to really be about is showing you how to narrative rather than telling you about the narrative how to how can you implement this into your games how can you um bring this into your yeah uh so we hope to be here fortnightly on the same time every fortnight um if it gets to the point that needs to be weekly we might consider it but I have a family. Andrew has a family. Um, we have wives, so we'll see what they say about it as well. <laughs> Real life gets in the way of gaming. It's a pain, but, you know. Yeah. Um, and I also have my second little one on the way. So we'll see what the wife says about that. <laughs> um, so I guess every show, we're going to plan to start off with a news segment. So um, news for us is obviously the narrative side of the news. Um and first part would be that we're getting Fire Slayers this week coming up. Yeah. Uh, fire Slayers, for those who don't know, are a race of fire slaying dwarves. They pretty much are fire dwarves. There's not much more to the basic gist of them. Uh, naked babies, as many people talk about them. But pretty even they're, they're naked fire dwarves, but the, again, the background stuff to them is, is um, quite extensive. And, and, because they were one of the first armies, they've had a bit of time to build up that law. And yeah. then the, yeah, the idea of like hammering runes into your flesh and having them go Nova is pretty cool. Yeah, um, we really got to explore that a bit in the latest Go Trek novel, uh, not novel, uh, what do you call it, audio book. You got to read about how they sort of work. And um, it's interesting seeing it from the point of a dwarf that's from the old world. <laughs> mm. And he's like, yeah, this is all weird and strange and stupid, but then sort of grows on over time, much like people do with Age of Sigma, really. Yeah. If you haven't read that, get on to uh, Realm Slayer. It is fantastic for that reason. It sort of shows you that path from fantasy players coming to Age of Sigma because that is effectively what Go Trek embodies. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, back onto the Fire Slayers. Uh, we're getting some cool, totally not endless spells. Yeah. Um, that Magma Dragon thing, whatever that is, Salamander, that is amazing. Yeah, it's a beautiful figure. I mean, uh, I'm not overly keen on the paint job they've shown us, but it'll be good to see when some people get hold of it and start doing some cool stuff. Yeah, I think um, once people get some um, objective source lighting happening on that, and it, it'll look amazing. The wall is a bit simple, but I think with a, once again with a really good paint job, the wall and the little sort of fireball, firebomb thing, yeah, will look fantastic. And they also they fit into the fluff. It's a bunch of fire and magma. That's fire slayers. Yeah. Um, especially like the wall of like fiery runes, there's runes all etched in that little firewall thing as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, touching on what you said before, it would be interesting to see how the narrative progresses on them. Mm. Uh, we'll probably do a show touching on the fire slayers. We'll probably do like all new books that come out talking about the narrative sort of stuff. Well, with the, uh, the Soul War stuff, everything's getting a little bit more story, so. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how they've progressed mm. in their way. Yeah, the uh, soul. Um, AOS coach just said you're a real life player, so yeah. <laughs> I do my best. <laughs> um, hey, coach, by the way. Um, but yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see how they progressed from that original sort of, oh, the Stormcast discovered these mercenary like dwarves. And they fought with them in the Realm Gate Wars because they were like, along with the Sylvan F, one of like the major fighting forces in the Realm Gate Wars. Yeah. So we haven't really touched on them much since then. Like, there's yeah. not, been a lot of fluff, not a lot of fluff in that like middling part of like the Seeds of Hope. There wasn't a lot about them then. Um, yeah, to be interesting to see what they're up to. I kind of get the impression that because they, when they, when they, because they were very, very early out, um, that whole, all the mercenaries they fight for anyone. Just seemed to work at the time, but there hasn't been a hell of a lot of fluff around that sort of narrative since the, the Realm Gate Wars. Um, yeah. They might drift away from that, maybe. I'm... It's yeah. I think in Go Treks Realm Slayer, they talk a little bit about that on how um, they're not necessarily mercenaries per se. They're they're sort of drawn to the Urgold, and they feel this need to have it. Yeah, which is again is a bit of a departure from that early stuff. But I think they, were, I think GW is still fine um, feeling their way with the army, mm. uh, and the Urgold's a nice twist and allows them to twist the narrative that way a little bit. It's cool. Yeah, for those who don't know, Urgold is the shattered remnants of their former god, and they sort of hoard and collect, not to ever. They have no intention of ever getting all this stuff together to rebuild him. Yeah. Um, um, and I think the only other thing coming out in Fire Slayers is we're getting the re-release of the Doomseek model. He's coming back to full time. And the, uh, the terrain piece. Ah, yes, and the terrain piece, the cog four thing. Yeah, I think that's what I'm referring to as a pizza oven. But, but, yeah. yeah, it sort of looks like one. Um, but I think the interesting thing is a bit more of the narrative behind the terrain piece. It doesn't sort of lend itself too much. And yeah. obviously, sort of guessing at what the Rome, not Rome, the spell sort of do. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, all, all the latest releases um, have had that terrain piece and then the spells or prayers or whatever. Um, and it always seems to have some integral part to the way. Um, the story has progressed, so you know, with the re-emergence of the gloom sprite from their caves, was the like uh, mm. to scare them out and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I, I like the terrain people. They have that little bit of narrative without having to do too much more. You literally yeah. just bring this model, and straight away the battlefield looks like it's supposed to have gloom spike gets versus iron net again. Yeah. yeah. Um. Uh. So yeah, that's and yeah, Doom Seeker is a really cool one. Uh, he was first released in Silver Tower, so he's getting a little re-release in a pack. Um, he's effectively, as his name would suggest, Doom Seeker Five. So he's sort of a take back to the old Slayers. Um, he's 
Seek an honourable death. Yeah. Um, Black Library release-wise, we've not had much in the way of Aegis release it releases lately. Um, we've got a few of the short stories from the Road to Wars. Uh, released by Hamilcar and Nicarada because they both had novels released lately. Yeah, yeah. no. Yeah. Um, I kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of hoping we start to see some more of, as I was saying just before we got on, the um, the Eight Lamentation stuff. They keep saying they're going to do a lot more of them, but we're still hanging on for them. Yeah, we've got three stories out now for that. Yeah, but only the one big one. Yeah, yeah I want another full blown novel. Um, and then for old time fantasy, we're getting a couple of re releases of some classic stories. Um, Caracate Peaks, the whole chronicles of that was Snake, Wall of Queen, and Thogrim. Yeah, great. Yeah, the, the three way between Skaven, Goblins, and Dwarves. And the City of Pillars, we're getting that coming back out. And Drakenfeld is getting re released, that classic vampire novel. Yeah. Um, if you haven't read Dragonfells or you weren't around when Dragonfells was originally released, I urge you to go give it a read. It's um, probably one of my fondest memories of fantasy. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. There is a series about the same thing, so Dragonfells is probably the best of the series, but there's a whole series about that character arc. Yeah. Um, so, I think that's it really for you. Probably before we start talking about stuff as I start picking up more on what narrative stuff is coming up. Um, but for today's show, we want to talk about the realms themselves. We thought what better place to start than the actual setting of Age of Sigma. Um, this has been a broad overview of all of them, some more than others because we know more about some than others. With Age of Sigma, everything is released narratively some realms just have not been touched upon much um and probably two of them change later in the year um but we'll maybe touch on that have been fully explored probably spend a little bit more time on fire just because the interesting rpg that's coming out will be set in the realm of fire for the major part of it um but yeah so I guess we have to give you to do we're going to explain as well um in like what are the realms that like if someone asks you what are the realms what would you say to them well i mean essentially the the, the thing to look at for most people who are looking at starting sigma is it's not your traditional high fantasy setting in that you have a medieval style world with um your traditional sort of nordic dwarf type and and um mystical elves and stuff, which is your standard high fantasy. The concept that the old world was destroyed and that each realm is basically like a, a swirling mass of magical energy with an island of uh, real space, if you like, in the middle of it, um, is the best way to describe the cosmology. But we're only just starting to get the tip of the iceberg, I think, with, with what life in those realms is actually like. Because when they first released it and people went, what, what is this stuff? Um, they didn't do a lot of background fluff. We didn't really get an understanding of how that structure worked. We saw these floating islands are, are named after all the old schools of magic. And people sort of went, well, I don't get it. Where are my maps? Where am I this? Where am I that? And with second edition coming out, GW have, have listened to their fan base. And now we suddenly have this wealth of information about each of these realms. And it's become apparent that just because one is the realm of fire, Akshi, doesn't mean that everything's burning. It means that, you know, that that's based on the, the realm of fire. So things might have a fiery element, but there's still snow there. There's still rivers. There's still life. Yeah, there's still forests and trees and greenery. And like you said, snow. I was reading or listening to an audio book the other day that talked about literally them going up a mountaintop and snow in the realm of fire. Yeah. And the, the, the hilarious comment in the first part is there is fire, there is snow in the realm of fire. Um, and that's what we, the the closer you get to um, the middle of these realms, which and if you think of them like the floating islands in a sea of magic, 
the closer you get to the middle, the more normalised life becomes. We, of course, with the exception of the realm of death at the moment, thanks to Nagash screwing everything up. Um, in Shaisha Traverse, so the centre is bad, the outer is better, but everywhere else, the closer to the centre, the more normal, in inverted commas, the world gets. Um, and that what exactly happens the further out you get depends entirely on which realm you're in. Um, but um, as Luke was saying, you know, we've, we've had a lot of them explored a little bit, a few explored extensively, and some not explored very much at all. Um, so Hayish, for example, the realm of light, we know basically nothing about. Um, whereas Akshi, uh, Shimon, and Gairan, we've had a lot of stuff about. Probably Gur and Shayish as well would put in that category now. Shayish now, yeah, with their soul, uh, soul wars and stuff, yeah. Um, Gur seems to be the focus of a lot of novels as well. Yeah, a lot, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of things people seem to go to Gur for some reason um, in the story. Maybe it's simply because it's, uh, they feel they need to explain Gur a bit more because it's quite easy to imagine the realm of metal or the realm of life. But the realm of beasts, um, they've described it a, a, a bit with like, you know, um, great ribs sticking out of places and all these god beast corpses lying around where Gorkamorka went nuts and beat them off to death. But um, it's a bit harder to imagine the setting, I think. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think with Age of Sigma 2 coming out, we, like you said, we've got maps, we've got all this big narrative of it. Completely, and I think probably the biggest one we got was that cosmology map of the realms and how they work. Yeah, we had Shaish on the bottom because it is effectively the underworld, you had Azur on top, heaven, um, and then you had the majority of the other ones actually, Shimon, uh, Gur, Giran, all floating in the middle. But then you had the two that we don't know about much, and that is Haish and Ulgu, light and shadow. And they act like sun and moon, apparently. Yeah, they orbit around each other and cause day and night in the other realms. Yeah. Right, we don't know much on that. It is with Age of Sigma, like I said, everything is revealed for the narrative. Um, it's why us. I guess people are jumping on the whole elves are coming next because we've just got Slanish revealed. Yeah. If Slanish is getting revealed, it makes sense that the armies after him would be the ones that were chaining him up before. Yeah, the um, Tyrion yes. and Malarian, the old Malekith, those of you that don't know, uh, survivor elder elf gods from the old realm, captured Slanish and tied him, her, it up and tried to suck all the souls of the elves back out um, with some success. I've um, got a question here from Mr. Ronnie. Uh, what realm would you like to see fleshed out next? And, uh, I guess that means any realm, like fleshed out more, fleshed out somewhat. Mm. To be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of waiting for Hayish. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I, I, I just, I'm not sure how the little tidbits we've got make it seem really cool, like, you know, crystal spires and everyone sort of picturing winged elves and things flying around. But I'm a picture of like all the prism sort of tower bits in it. Yeah, yeah, like oh. um, that's really cool. Base yeah. is good because all good, we, while we don't know much about it, we sort of have the idea of what it is. Yeah, we've got a bit of that in um, Daughters of Cain. Yeah. Not but a bit, a bit. Yeah, um, we, we have an idea of what it looks like. Yeah. But Haish, you know, we're, we're kind of um, picturing these multi hued planes and crystal spires and stuff. Um, my, my daughter actually was, when she was painting up her seraphon, decided she wanted to put them in Haish. And we had a long discussion about exactly how we'd make it look like that when we did the bases for that reason, because you're not really sure. That's yeah, they did a painting tutorial on Haish, which I thought was interesting. Mm. Um, so I, I like took that as like, oh, there's a little tidbit. Okay, this, it's only a painting on bases of a tutorial, the Shadow Dominion bases, but it gave you like a little bit of insight. You can sort of start to get that insight on it. 
yeah, the sort of colors that they were using and, and that sort of thing. Um, um, yeah, no, I use is definitely a good shout. It is probably the realm we know the least about. Mm. Um, for me, it's good. It, fun enough, it will be good. Um, I think for the reasons we discussed just before, it's hard to imagine. Like, I keep thinking of Gur as just this, oh, it's Garan on steroids. Yeah, yeah. And it's, or, and it's um, close second would be Azir. I'd really like to see more of Azir, like the wilds of Azir. Whether we're going to get Azir, to be honest, I, they seem to be leaving it alone. Like, I don't know why. Well, I guess we've got like those little tidbits mm. of um, like the the death coming alive in his ear. Um, mm. I guess Sigma's vault with a uh, forbidden power opening up. Yeah, the images we've had too, the the, the pictures that they gave us of that it feels almost um, futuristic. It almost feels like a sort of a Blade Runner type situation. Um, some of the big spires and the, the cities it feels like mm. an urban uh, yeah um although we did have we do know the cool bit of fluff about the dragon ogres from us here that they used to live there until sigma kicked them out yeah so. um and that there are or tribes that stormcast still go fight to this day in his they exist in there yeah well they're, they're orcs are everywhere aren't they can't get rid of them like cockroaches yeah um yeah I think, yeah. Azir and Gur for me, the two sort of not sure. Yeah, and I like to see how each, um, Gur, Gur too, I think you're right. Like, the, um, what I'm doing as we're talking here is rebasing uh, my destruction, my uh, gut busters and various other destruction things. And I was looking at putting them in Gur. Now, I'll get to that when we talk about how I come to those things. But one of the things I was thinking is, how am I going to base these guys? Yeah, I think it's probably a reason, like, I mean, I painted up a lot of my stuff in life, and, like, mm. life is just an easy one to go on. You put flowers on your base, you put lots of grass. Um, I guess um, Coach brings up a good point. Uh, the realms of chaos, we probably should mention them as well, because they are realms in themselves, and um, probably the only book we really have extensive sort of chatting about them on. Or like knowledge of them from is a book called Plague Garden, which mm. features a bunch of stormcasts called the Hallowed Knights, and a guy called Guard of Steel Soul. He's really freaking cool. Yeah. Um, for his story arc, he's probably personally my favorite one of any of the stormcast characters out. Mm. Um, and we get a little bit of a look at the Roman Nurgle, and we find that they are just like other realms, sort of. Like there are people living there, and they live. Just people. They're not chaos worshippers in any way. They are just people that apply their livelihood in the realm of Nogal. They grow crops. They have families. They work. They do normal people stuff. They have towns. Yeah, and it's the first time that because um, the realm of chaos has been around in GW mythology since the beginning. Um, and I had those original two realm of chaos books way, way, way back when. But this is the first time that we've we've had that sort of. Uh, fluff revealed about that because you you they were always described like it is currently in um, 40k all of it's a swirling mass of demons and horrible crap but in sigma as you say they are realms and yeah, but, how do people live there yeah. yeah and like we've only had the realm of noble truly we sort of had you know i guess the start of eight lamentations a bit of the realm of corn mm. um but not yeah. Um, we got the idea that there's caves and deserts and stuff from the start of that, but not really much. And, and yeah, yeah. Play, play going, we just got so much on that realm. Yeah. We know the corn sits on a massive pile of skulls, but that's about it. Uh, um, we know Zenit exists in some middle of some giant crystal labyrinth. Yeah. And we know we literally know nothing about Slanish's realm. No, it was the the sort of hint being that it's, it's probably a world in decline because their lords disappeared for the minute. Yeah, um, I guess talking about the chaos factions, uh, we should talk about the fifth chaos faction and how they sort of live in the live don't live within the realms, and it's a realm of its own, really. Yeah, because um, that was, um, 
that was an interesting part when they when they did release Sigma, the fact that they elevated the god of the Skaven, the Ratman, to the pantheon of Chaos Gods. Yeah, he's, he's the fifth god. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting about them is they don't they live. Oh, I forget the name of Lutheran now. Like they, they live, yeah, the Blight City kind of exists um, half in and half out of um, the Royal of Chaos. And mm -hmm. bolt holes that extend from it into pretty much every realm. Uh, yes. And it's it's their fault though, that the uh, Nagash's plan got screwed up. Yes, Gaven 2, Nagash 0. Yep, that's right. If you've read any fantasy stuff, you know that reference really well. They have done it before. And back in um, uh, fourth and fifth, they had one of the worst items or best items to pick. Hey, you could give one of your heroes was the Fellblade. Oh, I remember the Fellblade fondly. Because that was the sword that cut off Nagash's hand. Um, and the yeah. I run around with that. But, um, but yeah, so I guess that's a sort of a brief explanation on the realms themselves. Well, brief, we've been going for a bit. But um, explanation on how they. They coexist with each other. The ones we know more about, the ones we don't. Um, so, I guess two parts of like the next thing to talk about is life in the realms, yep. and how it directly affects the inhabitants. Now, the thing with the, the realms, like the realm of fire, in affects the people that live in it more than it affects the terrain. Yeah. Um, if you're in the realm of fire, you generally more likely to anger if you know they're a bit of a hot-headed person they have a bit of a temper quick to anger yeah, yeah. that sort of thing you know, you're in the realm of uh, the realm of beasts you're a bit more savage you have that sort of animalistic side to you mm. um it's really interesting to see that because obviously we have all these people coming from the realm of vizier the realm of heavens and they're very noble and they sort of look down at all the other people in the realms. Yeah, they're a bit snooty. Yeah, you know, like we're, we're sort of this angelic people mm. and you're, oh, you're from here, you're, you're a bit of a barbarian to us. Yeah, um, one of the things we haven't touched on either is that there, there is actually travel between the realms. Yes, well, that's um, probably good to mention. Yeah. Um, the, the realm gates, which allow travel between the realms, which were in the heyday of... Uh, Sigmar's uh, reign, trade travel through it quite easily between the realms, and then of course there are the coming of chaos. All the um, realm gates get corrupted, closed, whatever, and Sigmar locks himself away in, um, in his realm. And yeah. now we're um, slowly reclaiming all of them. Yeah, or at least reclaiming some, and generally they're where cities are built on for the realm. For the, um, I think we'll talk about realm gates in a sec. I do have them planned to be talked about because um, they're a thing in its own within the realms, really. They're not as simple as a gate as what the model would suggest. No, because they're different. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, life in the realms is like a person. Like, be that whatever that person may be, that could be beastman. Chaos Skaven. Um, the realms affect you if you're from them. Yeah. And if you spend time in them. Yeah, and that's one of the things too when, when we talk about um, narrative um, construction of an army, um, that's going to reflect um, how you write your story. Like, who, what are your characters like? How do they respond in situations? It's going to depend a lot on where they're from as much as what they are. Yeah, um, you know, we all know what, say, beastmen are. They're a bunch of savage, uh, animalistic, abhuman people. I use the term people loosely in this sense. A um, uh, bunch of abhuman creatures, and they sort of despise civilization. But they're very different depending on what realm they're from. Like the realm of beasts is probably the truest form of beastmen. Yeah. They're, and utter ferocity, and then you're probably a pure beastman. But say, um, let's say the realm of death, your beastman might be a fair bit more like shamanistic in how they go about mm. 
you know, there's been a lot more sort of voodooing going, oh, we'll eat your souls as well. Yeah, uh, and that was the thing too when um, in, uh, Malign Portons came out and we got um, a lot more insight into death and we found out that all the different um, afterlives of all the different peoples exist in the realm of death. Um, so depending on the people, just so the living people live there alongside, in some instances, the spirits of their ancestors. So yes, be interesting. To live. Yeah, there's also what is it the um the Ideneth Deacon Enclave. For those who don't know, Ideneth Deacon, they sort of raid souls and steal souls to feed their own bodies, effectively. Mm. Long and short of it, and um, they inhabit this entire underworld where they make people believe if you drown you go to this underworld and they influence it in such a way that all these drowned souls come into their underworld because they believe that's where they go but then the INF take the said souls yeah trick them into stealing their souls yeah yeah this particular enclave doesn't actually go to war to claim souls they trick people yeah this is the death that awaits you and so these people believe it and their souls go to the INF um but yeah so it, it affects you um living in these realms your temperament as you can imagine like your temperaments uh differ yeah people from shimon tend to be a bit more fluid in their outlook because everything in shimon is changeable yeah you're a bit more hot tempered if you're from the wrong fire you're a bit more savage from the realm of beasts. You're very solemn and dreary if you're from the realm of death. Um, life shadow, we're not too sure. We don't have much information. Um, the realm of Zia, you're very, you, you see yourself as very angelic. Yeah. Other people see you as a stuck, a stuck up stall, a stuck up snob. Um, and it generally happens that way um, in the free cities. At least, uh, those from Azir generally find themselves into the nobility above people of other realms. Yeah, but then they can find themselves natural rulers. Yeah, being this angelic, well, we're godlike. We live with a god. That means we're the ruling caste. Yeah, we're better than you. Um. Yeah. Um. I guess. We'll backtrack a little bit to the realm gates and how they because they're an important part of the realms themselves um now as you mentioned before they're a way for interstellar travel between the realms like a better term yeah the correct term Stargate. um yes yeah, stargate perfect way to like figure out how they do this is stargate <laughs> it's not too different to be honest um the realm gates can be attuned to go to different places um some are set in stone yeah and they're not all well we've got the model for the realm gate um but i guess that's not sort of true as what the realm gates really are there's lots of variations in what they can be yeah, the, the different um, books have described them obviously in different ways, um, depending on the realm that they're in, the realm they lead to. Um, it might be you know, something like Iran, it might be a, uh, a geyser of water or something. Um, in Shimon, it might be a shivering you know, mercurial portal. Uh, it yeah. depends entirely on the realm and things like yeah. that. In Garan, it's like the hollow of some ancient tree. Um, but it can be anything you could possibly imagine a realm gate. It doesn't have to be a symbol. Um, and especially, I guess, more so for you know, watching who's thinking about the AOS RPG that's coming out from Cubic 7. Um, that's something to consider when writing your narrative for your story is that realm gates don't need to be gates. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess, um, like my own variation in my free city, we've got the, the rain god above it, and he brings down his ra magical rain that fills all these springs, but it's these springs that are actually the realm gates. So you dive in the water, and that's the actual realm gate. 
Um, even really cool ones that the roll gates are inside god beasts. Mm. Um, in the uh, uh, Realm Slayer audiobook, once again, it's a really good explore, exploration of the realms. Um, there's this god beast in the realm of Shaish that Nagash sort of betrayed. So it decides, well, screw you, I'm going to eat your realm gate. And so it eats the wrong gate, and now its mouth is the wrong gate. Well, its yeah. stomach is the wrong gate. Yeah. Well, the story, don't mess with the god beast. No. Um, so I think we'll talk a bit about the tabletop sort of implications of the realm now. Um, what they bring to an army, how you use them with an army, how you use them in the games. A bit more of the tabletop sort of matter now. Um, we're not going to talk about anything competitive or anything like that. It's not what we're trying to aim for here, and just like how these things can enhance your game. Um, now, you'll generally hear them referred to as realm rules. And different events use different amounts of them, different people like playing with different amounts of them, and it's completely fine on whatever amounts you like playing with. Um, like there are times when I prefer to play with less. There's times when I prefer to play with, with everything. And it all depends on the set. But I think in some capacity, they can always be used. And I think... Even, um, yeah. even some of the more competitive events, are uh, pretty much all of them now are allowing minimum items in the realms. Yeah, and even that is still some narrative to your force. You're picking... Yeah three items from like you're picking your items from the list of items available from Shaish. Yeah. I mean we all know there's some magical orc that's um some magical dude that sells ethereal amulets out to everyone with a zombie dragon. You get fifty percent off your own a zombie dragon. Um, everyone dragon has to <laughs> um but yeah it's serious it's a great way just to add a little bit of narrative go I'm from this realm. And you can Build upon that. Just the artifacts you can build upon that in your story. And, and when it comes back to that that, that uh, narrative structure of your own force, like um, my my free city is in Shimon, and none of the factions that I, I have yet to take any item for any at least I put together that isn't from Shimon or a general one. Um, simply because that's that's the narrative rules that I've implied upon myself. And yeah, sometimes that. There are better options, but my narrative is Shimon, so that's where they come from. Yeah, and I'm sort of forcing that upon myself now, um, especially playing my mixed order force. It's from Giran, so I'll be using a lot of the Realm of Life stuff. Um, but, right, let's not say do. You could think of, okay, which items do I like best? Yeah. And I'll, you can start with that. It's a starting point going, oh, I like the Ethereum and the in-game. So you can go, well... Oh, well, I'm using the death items, so why don't I do a little bit of death stuff to my models? Yeah. Put a skull on your base. Um, yeah. There's painting tutorials. Use purples and blacks and stuff on your base. You know, make your models that little bit dreary. Do your skin tones that little bit paler. Yeah, I think, I think that, that sort of touches on that that, um, that opening question whenever you start looking at, that, at your army. Um, there's generally a spark. There's something that tells you at that beginning point where, where you know it's going to go, where's my realm going to be? Sometimes it might be the selection of an item, as you say. Sometimes it might be a bit of fluff. Sometimes it might be something unrelated to Sigma. It might be a story that works, and you, then you think, which realm would that story work better in? And you go with that route. Um, any of those things are a valid starting point. Yeah, and it doesn't sort of matter which way you start. Like you can add that little bit of narrative. Either way you start, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the realm artifacts are generally allowed in any event, whether it be that competitive or whatever. Um, so they're a really good point to start on. Um, I guess the other part, there's not they're the only ones that apply army list building wise. Yeah, yeah, because the other ones to impact the gameplay itself. Um, and, and a lot of events now are. Uh, picking and choosing individual realm traits for rounds. 
um, so that for this round your game is in. Um, and be because of the competitive setting, obviously they rule out some of the really narrative ones that you really need to plan for, um, like the the realm of beast ones where there's one, monsters wandering around the table. Realm of shadow where it directly affects anything with range. Yeah, those sorts of things. Um, no, that's completely fine. Like it's a competitive event. You want to be balanced. Yeah, for lack of a better term. Like yeah. that's completely fine. Yeah, of course. It means that, and it, I mean those uh, those other sort of uh, wackier ones really are for those narrative events. Yeah, and I think that's fine. Like Games Workshop have been more than open in saying like pick and choose how you want to play. Yeah, that is the benefit of the three matched open narrative. That's the benefit of it. Take what you want, play with what you want. Um, I will always support realm rules being used in a in a competitive environment. Mm. Um, I think I posted. I can't remember what we were chatting about. I think it was on the post of like we got asked the question of like what realm rules do you like? And um, my response was I like using at least some. The realm rules allow players of a narrative mindset or even an open play mindset, a more casual mindset that like the story to play in a tournament. Mm. Like, they don't care about doing well. They care about their story. And if yeah. you can give them that little bit of a hook to make that story, they'll come to your competitive event. Yeah. And that benefits both parties. The narrative player might find some more competitive people that like his narrative style play and competitive might find, oh, this narrative guy likes coming to our events. We get more numbers. Yeah, awesome. More numbers at the end in events is what we all want. Um, maybe except that he might have had enough. I think may not want more than the real event. <laughs> Hashtag make it 300. <laughs> Every show's going to get that. Um, but yeah, and I think CanCon was a really great example of that sort of mindset. There were real movies, and we had plenty of people there that brought very fluffy narrative lists. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, and I'd like to say I did, but I didn't. And the, the mortally wounded guys with uh, Sydney Slaughter every year, that's custom scenarios. And they, they, it really lends itself to running a, your own force through the narrative of them too. So, And even though it is a competitive event, there is a strong narrative element and it really does bridge that that uh, divide, I think. Yeah, I think um, just little hooks that like TOs can use to make these events more narrative. Like um, AOS Coach did a great one at Sydney GT last year where it's name your characters and you get an actual tournament point for naming your characters. Yes. Yeah. Um, like anyone who read the player pack, like there were some people who just picked stupid names, but the fact was they read the tournament pack, they go, oh, I can name my characters. That's cool. And then they were talking about, um, who was it? Uh, one of them with daughter's game list named them all after like pop singers. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it was cool. He talked about, I saw the poster on it and he's talking about, oh, Beyonce did this. <laughs> and it's like, while it's silly, it's still narrative in some way. Like, you, you don't have to take note. I think that's a good point. And, like, narrative doesn't have to be serious. You can be stupid and silly. Yeah. Um, yeah for me, like, saying, you know, you get extra points for naming your characters, that was like, well, cool, I'll do that anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, well, um, I had one of my friends, Cron, uh, the world's best character and overlord player. <laughs> um, he. Went that step over and named all these airships as well. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. You encourage that. You encourage something, and you went that step further. Yeah. My um, Peradron for my free city, I've actually commissioned um, the very talented Mary Dearden to draw to paint for me um, the girls to go on the side of the ships. So I have yeah. like the World War Two, um, you know, girls on the side of the planes. I have a unique dwarven chicky to get one into a transfer to go on the side of each of my issues oh wow that sounds amazing but yeah um those little bit of narrative hooks can help to get both sides or i should say all three because there are three different ways to play together and working together to build the community as a whole and all parts of the hobby should always be together trying to build as a group and look, on, on that i mean i just think um it's worth mentioning that the Age of Sigma community in general is very uh, receptive to those multiple play styles. Um, I think they're one of the best communities in Wargaming. 
and they they do tend to be inclusive and all that. I mean, there's exceptions in every game, but for the most part, the Sigma players are a pretty great bunch of boys. And yes. <laughs> like, um, yeah, I like, couldn't agree more. Like, you're just being accepting of like, all the different play styles and realizing that not everyone has the same way to play, and that's completely fine. Um, but yeah, um, so yeah, back on track, like the realm rules bar the artifacts are all determined by how we play the game, they're all like sort of random effects. Um, I think they're split into really three different parts. Probably the most, u- most used, um, you've got the command traits, realmscapes, uh, features, yep. um. I will send them to you later. I am very sorry. I forgot that. Someone just reminded me. I promised to send them the um, Firestorm color schemes. <laughs> um, I will send them after to you. Um, but, uh, yeah, to back away. We've got the Realmscape features, the Realm command traits and such, and the, what's the other part? The generic magic spell. And they're also in the core rule book, and they're generally called the core realm spells. Um, I think they're the most used part of what we're going to talk about. And then, obviously, after that, we have the realm spells. Yeah, there are spells in the realm portents which open up basically whole schools of spells for each realm. Yeah, um, they are very much less used. Although yeah. they were apparently used at Adepticon. Okay. Um, and generally used at all the GW heats because GW will always tell you to use all the rules. Um, and I mean, looks and some of the some of those spells are really good, and some of them are a bit. Yeah. yeah. And um, it depends again if when you stick into your narrative, uh, for example, if that opens up the option for that. Um, as in the wizards or spellcasters from your army can know your realm spells. Mine are only ever going to know shaman spells. Yeah, I think personally, I would prefer the realm spells to be by the army creation. Mm. Um, but that's a completely different discussion. And yeah, you can change it up and change that however you want. Um. So yeah, they now the realmscapes, realm rule, these sort of realm rules, they govern. They're effectively used to represent the table you're playing on, where you're playing in the realms. Um, the realmscapes are a bunch of little niche sort of features that sort of give you an idea of like some terrain feature that you're fighting over, um, from geysers of boiling hot lava to uh, trees popping up everywhere to. Uh, your visibility range being six inches because there is fog and shadows everywhere. Yeah, yeah and some of them impact the game much more than others. Yeah, some, um, and so that's obviously why some events limit and pick which ones. Yeah. But, you know, in, if you're playing in a narrative setting, there will be times where these become apparent. Um You know, and it can make for a really cool game. Uh, like Realm of Shadow, where all of a sudden, oh, everything can only see six inch. And it sees six inches, can't declare charges out, outside of six and stuff like that. It's yeah. cool. Yeah, um, they're into each other. Yeah. yeah. And yes, in a more competitive setting, that might be an issue, but in a narrative setting, the character and Overlord getting jumped by the corn demons that they couldn't see is completely narrative. Yeah. You know, you can play out that narrative story. Can the Caradrons be compete with these, fight back all these nasty demons that they couldn't see that just appear in front of them? Yeah. And I mean, people coming, and as you say, look, there's nothing wrong with any play style. And mm. people that are going to go to a narrative event knowing that they're going to a narrative event will be really excited for that sort of thing. I mean, that, that, that makes for just a, a, a immense amount of fun when your um, characters are struggling to survive in horrible odds, and when they do survive, you get bragging rights. Uh, yes, I did this really cool thing. Um, 
and think I'm running a narrative event in July. Uh, it's those sort of emotions that I want to try and get into the narrative event of like these little triumphs. I really tried to work it into like how I wrote the event so that winning isn't necessarily governed by who wins the most games. Yeah. Every player can win on their own merits. You might go to this event going, I want to kill the general of this guy's army because my army hates him. Yeah. And your whole narrative event experience is trying to hunt down your friend who's trying to run away from you. Yeah. You know, that's, and if he escapes, he wins. That's his narrative going, ha ha, I escaped your clutches. And um, if you manage to get him, you go, I gotcha. Yeah, and then the other thing from um, the Cinderfall event that you're running, um, right across all the other events, the idea that you can tailor the odd model, the odd hero for the event it is really cool. Uh, yeah, um, obviously, I have the specially built model that you can do. Um, it could just be a normal wizard, and by all means, that's fine. And so, I guess that's sort of me trying to get competitive players just to come over and play. Yeah, like they can just bring that model. Um, I'm obviously doing the Gumby armor, being the Gumby army, being the TO. So I'm just going to use a Hurricane for this special wizard character. Like I'll use a eccentric model, but I don't. For me, I've got enough to do without having to yeah. convert a model for it. So I'll just use a really ostentatious model that I already own in these paintings. Whereas I'm, I'm going to town on a heavily converted uh, cauldron of blood. Nice. I look forward to seeing, look forward to seeing, you know, if one or two people do it the first year, it'll be cool. And then you can sort of build on it and build on it. Um, there was one Adepticon or Las Vegas open last year where they had to build ships. Mm. Yes, yes. Uh, Everyone built an airship. Yeah. And um, all the different armies building different styles of airship. Yeah. yeah, I'm just like, that'd be so cool. I can imagine like my Scourge Privateer army with like some, I'd probably grab like the Dark Eldar Raider and convert that up somehow. Mm. Um, Very cool. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's really too much more to talk about on the basis of the realms. We sort of covered a lot of the stuff on like what are they with the people in them, stuff like that. Is there anything you feel that needs to be said about the realms? No, I, mean, I think that's the, a good intro. Um, this maybe uh, we move into how you can do that with your models on it. Is and that, that's the part that I, that I find the most enjoyable is looking at that background and how do I do that on my little dudes? Yeah, I think an interesting one, like free guild, I think is the most interesting mm. for this sort of thing. Like I've seen so many cool converted free guild models to represent different realms. Yeah. I mean, I think, and Firestorm opened up a lot of that as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, yeah probably downside is that focused on two realms but then it focused on the two realms we knew the most about yeah in um, fire fire and life yeah but um just just uh, even though it was only far enough just the, the the modeling in there and showing you like the, the dispossessed and the, the um iron world and the different um, factions painted as part of those three cities um that just takes you in directions that you may not have considered like a group of dwar of uh, dispossessed Dwarven longbeards painted in greens because they're from Gairan. Um, that sort of thing. That order because you look at those models, you go up oh, metal. But yeah, but then they've got this amazing greenish hue to them. Yeah, like uh, suddenly it's not metal; it's wood. Yeah, and even and then you can tie in that that fluff, um, the stuff from. Um, I think it was one of the short stories tied to Eight Lamentations when. They, they go into what was once a Dwarden realm in Gairan and instead of burrowing into the mountains, they burrowed into the trunks of the massive trees. Yeah, yeah, it's fire slayers that lived in a forest. Yes, yeah. Um, so instead of living the ground, they live inside these you know, continent-sized trees. Um, just all this sort of stuff. And then when you come to, to putting your models together, 
And uh, then you start working out color schemes and things and you think, okay, well, how am I going to do this? How am I going to make this seem that way? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, like well, color scheme is obviously like the number one way you sort of first think about it. You can go on to converting stuff and your basing yeah. obviously has a massive impact. Like um, I did wrong with life, so I picked up some little flowers Yep. You can see that, little flowers, and they just go all over random models in the army. Yeah. Well, the, the thing uh, with those, the bases for my three city in Shamon, um, where when I'm ba doing the bases, I'm sculpting the rivers of molten uh, silver, or quicksilver rivers on all my bases. Um, when I'm doing the actual ground on the bases too, like it's, it's brown, but then I add bronze into the brown, so it has a metallic hue to it um, to make it look that way. Um, this army that I've been pulling apart while we're sitting here, the basing for that, I started by looking at um, realm stuff again. And in Gur, there's descriptions in one of the uh, one of the books of uh, a field that is basically all rib cages and bones, but it's uh, covered in little red flowers, and the whole field is just red flowers. So well, today I've been scouring the net trying to find the brightest red flowers I can find to, to put on my bases to have them from that sort of plane. Um, and, now, and then I've got to find them. I'll probably get that uh, Citadel kit that's full of skulls um, just to break up and put some bones all over the place as well. Yeah, yeah and you know, basing is a really great way to bring out your models and give them life in the realms. Yeah. Yep. You know, so much, I guess, fantasy was a bit basic for that, where everyone just put grass and green flock and a goblin green bait trim. Yeah, but I mean, that, that's what I was saying before uh, about the idea of that high fantasy setting. Nearly all the high fantasy settings that we've had, um, wargaming and otherwise, have, uh, well, they harken back to Tolkien and mm. um, yeah, that, that uh, Western European background, which is why I mean, the old world was basically, the empire was Germany. Uh, you know, Renaissance. Britannia was Britain or France. Yeah, that's right. Um, and all of it is Western European. So everything was green basically on the bases, uh, with the exception of course of uh, Kemri um, and you know, dead uh, Egyptians. But even then when they started to bring out Towards the end of fantasy, with Tilia and the uh, uh, Dogs of War and stuff, it was still green. Whereas yeah. the realms, the you know, how how you represent those realms on your basing on your models is, is part of the fun, I think, because uh, they are very different. Yeah, and like like we just talked about before, you can the realms you can find like how does snow work in the realm of fire? How does all these different things work in these particular realms. Yeah. Uh, then, like you said, molten rivers of quicksilver, that's in the realm of metal, but in the realm of life, it's a magical blue, this pristine, clear water. Unless yeah. it's been messing with it. Yeah, unless it's the nerve infected parts, and then it's uh, all sorts of green and river torrents. Um, so it's not in Adelaide, our river is horrendous. Um, I'm, I'm in uh, country New South Wales, so well, what's a river? <laughs> yeah, um, but you can use that basing. And then obviously on top of that, your colour scheme of your army can be respective of your realm. You can still do whatever colour you want, but you can have like those spot colours on the army just tying back into your realm. Yeah, and it doesn't always take, it doesn't take a lot. Um, as I said, like before I, well, I start putting an army together, my my initial research is always background. And then before I generally pick up a brush, my, my thoughts are, how do I show that idea on these models? Um, and everything's got, for me, I, t I want to tie it cohesively together, but also want to make it clear that that story, that background is here on my table. Um, and for the most part, um, the hobby stuff in Sigma is very good. The standard is very high, and playing across the two 
two armies on the tabletop DC, two armies on the tabletop playing into a you know a good standard. It's a really uh, really quite a spectacle, and I think that's part of our, part of the narrative is you, you you can tell that story based on these little guys killing each other in front of you on the tabletop. Yeah, um, I think just yeah, like I said, it doesn't take much to do that. I mean, the free city you've been working on called Molten Heart. It doesn't take much to figure out oh, molten so molten and heart you've got two colors sort of in your mind there already and it depends and you know it doesn't need to be a lot but you can go as little as much as you want um, yeah commission the the symbol for my free city uh, i've turned that into various sized uh, transfers which i put on my models all over the place because the free city has its standing army and stuff now so all the shields have the symbol on it um, you don't have to go to those lengths. Um, you can simply just use the same colours across the other. That's enough. Yeah, that's how I came about. Like Realm of Life. Originally, I knew I was going to do Realm of Life when I painted up my table that I use at home in the uh, Silver Net Veil scheme yeah. that GW put out. So I'm like, well, I did that. So I want my models to fit on my table. I don't care about going to an event if they don't fit on the tables there. When I'm at home, I want my models to look like they belong on my table. Yeah. And so I'm like, well, I'm just going to be from the realm of life then because that's where my table is set. So that started me thinking on the colours and I'm like, well, greens. And then I'm like, well, I really like blue anyway, so I'm going to use blue. Yeah. Um, and then the green is realm of life, so blue and green. And bang, I've got that little bit of, I've got a colour I want and a little bit of, the realm of life aspect in the army's overall look. Yeah. So you can look at my army and you can go, oh, they're blue and they're a nice bl bright blue and they're a bright green. They've got to be from the realm of life. Yeah. And I mean, and the thing is too, with, with that, like the, for the people that are narrative gamers, um, not not to disparage uh, tournament goers and, and uh, competitive players at all, but people that are of a more narrative uh, bent, will notice that and, and look at your army and ask you, oh, realm of life. And you're, oh, yeah, yeah, they are. Thanks. You know, stuff like that. Um, and it's almost like this little subset of uh, Sigma players and you sort of recognise a, a narrative -y <laughs> when you, you meet them across the table and they want to go through your background and things like that, which is always really cool. Yeah. Um, I think... I think that's probably it, really, talking about the realms. We've been through what the realms are, the people inside them, I guess, realm gates. Um, we'll probably end up exploring a few more realms in detail in the near future. Um, there's obviously some, probably do an episode or two talking about the characters that are coming out in the Age of Sigma RPG in depth. Um, that'll be cool to talk about. Um, and probably look at it more of the races. We'll probably do fire slayers in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, once the book's out, I've had a read. We go back and look at it as a fluff and stuff, like fire slayers. We'll try and talk about what's hot, pun intended. I'll see if I can grab my hook by then. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, there's been a little bit of fire slayers. We've also had a few novels come out about them. Um, but yeah, I think that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much for coming on with me, Andrew. No problem. And yeah, thank you everyone for watching. Thank you everyone for your questions. We hope to be back in a couple of weeks, same time. Um, mm. If there's a demand for it, then we'll see if we can. Sometimes we might be able to do weekly, but it'll most likely be two every second week. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for joining. And we'll catch